<laughs> I am uh, the coordinator for Citizen Network North America. Um, I also have um, the pleasure of working with Cornell University's Yangtan Institute on Employment and Disability as part of their faculty there. Um, through my role with Cornell, I have cultivated um, and facilitate a 15-week online uh, interactive deep dive into something called citizen-centered leadership. Um, and that work is, uh, we're touching on it a little bit here, that work is my passion. It's the um, the framework and the context in which um, I strive, I think, um, to bring uh program services, support technical assistance to the work that I do through Cornell, and to bring it as a resource to um, my role here with Citizen Network. And I'll just start by saying that, um, that citizen-centered leadership is um, rooted in something called person-centered planning um, and, and inclusion. And it's rooted based on the pioneers and the adventurers who created the original person-centered planning processes, methods, and approaches. Those names are John O'Brien, Jack Pierpoint, Beth Mount, um, Marsha Forrest, right? Linda Kahn. Um, these are folks who brought to the world the ideals of person-centered work. And it and within those ideals of person-centered work, this concept of citizenship is just um, is just based. John O'Brien says, citizens are people who can say, I belong to this place and its people, and I'm willing to act from responsibility for my belonging. For those who've been marginalized, um, the presumption of being a contributing member of society is an integral element for inclusion in our communities. Today's discussion is framed in the context of citizen as a basic human right for all people. And so with that, I'm going to just share my screen with you all um, and, and tell you a little bit about why it matters um, in my mind and hope that it spurs um, lively discussion on the other end. So I started this work 11 years ago based on a, set, a series of questions and frustrations that I um, experienced as a, as a professional working in the field of intellectual and developmental disabilities, and then later branching into other populations. Um, I've worked in, in state prison systems. I've worked in um, state psychiatric centers. I'm, I am based in New York State in the United States. Um, and, and prior to working with Cornell, I um, provided services as, you know, right in the community alongside other service providers. So, and I was just drawn by this idea of um, being driven by person-centered planning and all, and learning from all of the leaders and all of, um, you know, just the, um, uh, the architects of that incredible work and questions just kept coming up, which which um, were along the lines of, you know, with all of this technology, with all of this wisdom, how is how come our communities are no different, <laughs> right? They're not, they're, uh, the, the, um, the numbers of people or the, um, you know, just, just the, where are the people who have been marginalized all of their lives, right? Why are our communities no more inclusive than ever? Before, you know, even though we've been learning and working about all this stuff, um, you know, around inclusion, around person centered work. And so that was a driving question for me, along with um, the notion that ideas like person centered work, like valued social roles, like inclusion became very trendy words, they became buzz words. And so people were using them and applying them and saying they were doing the good work that um, is, is presumed when we use those words. Um, but I had just noticed this, this real slide, slide away from the authenticity of really walking alongside people, supporting people, raising people, elevating voices, um, and building a community where, in fact, everyone does matter. And so all of those questions and frustrations led me to spend a, a year interviewing and recording and creating what is citizen-centered leadership, um, which is just a an intensive um, theory to practice 
um, community of practice approach to figuring out how we can work together to create systemic change in how society views and values uh, and treats people with disabilities in particular, but anyone who's been excluded because of difference and difference that's been identified as negative. Um, so me and my posse, we're working to change that um, one person at a time, one community at a, at a time. And so we, again, are so glad that you are here to, to, to think through this with us a little bit. Just to, you know, um, just to kind of set again a little bit of a context, I, I, I often call this um, idea um, the community building imperative. You know, why do we have to have something like a citizen centered um, approach? And, um, and I, I believe because historically, people with significant disabilities, people whose difference marginalizes them, have always been cast out, have always, since the beginning of time, been pushed aside. And so just, you know, like way back in, you know, the day, right, eugenics, um, you know, was a model that was, um, you know, used to deal with people who had disability. You know, the idea was to get rid of bad seeds, right, in quotes from the gene pool, right, just clean that out. That And by the way, um, all of these models still exist in some form or fashion today, so they're not gone. And Hence, you know, that's why I think there's an imperative, right? The tragedy or the charity model of disability, which is really driven by pity, right up there through the Jerry Lewis telethons, you know, the medical model and the rehab model, which is look for a cure, right? Or fix the person. And those are the most, in the United States anyway, the most prevalent models still in existence, still going strong. And they're the, they're, um, the models that most of our, structures, bricks and mortars, our systems, our practices, and our process are built within. Um, and then, of course, there's the disability or the social model where impairment becomes disabled by um, by society, right? You know, that the person's impairment is, is an impairment, only becomes a disability if the assistance or the support that they need to be able to contribute and fully function isn't provided. And then this idea of radical, um, a radical model, which is a dude by the name of A.J. Withers in, um, in uh, Canada, who, who talks about the radical model of disability, which is there is nothing that isn't fully human about us. Um, and it's it, even the social model of disability, um, uh, you know, kind of perpetuates the discrimination and the stereotypes of folks. So, um, you know, just to kind of set as a frame that, you know, throughout history, people whose difference is identified because of disability have been pushed out, are at the margins. The last thing that I just want to qualify, I guess, in this moment is the word citizen. Um, you know, when I was thinking about this work and I, I was trying to I was trying to figure out a word <laughs> that could be used that might have a universal humanistic appeal. Um, and so keeping in mind this was 11 years ago, um, a lot has happened in the United States, but across the world since then. Um, and I and the word citizen has been contested, um, especially here in the States. Um, you know, there are, when I use the word citizen, I do not intend it to mean what, what country you were born in. Um, I don't intend it to mean, show me your passport. Do you, you know, I intend it to mean that it is a shared sense of humanity, that we're all part of the human race um, as citizens. Like back in the, back in the ancient times, you know, where um, you know, you, we are just part of community and everyone belongs. And so when I use the word citizen, it's within that context, not one that has to do with political um, or the legal ramifications. So when we think about um, exclusion, when we think about the models of disability and how people with disability have historically been treated, I love this particular graphic. It's a set of um, circles with a bunch of different colors in it. Many of you will have probably seen this um, at some point before. I just think it does a beautiful job of um, 
really driving home, <laughs> you know, uh, the idea of us and them, right? You know, which to me is the marginalization of anyone who is different. So there are three, there are four circles on the page. There's a line separating in the middle of the page. Three circles are down below, one circle above, and we're going to look at the circles below. There are Three in a row. The one, um, there, one on the left. Oh, and in each of the circles are um, um, colored, different colored dots. Um, so there's yellow and blue and red and green and um, green represents the the green color is is the dominant color and it represents um, I the majority, right? The normal, what would be considered normal or the majority. Um, and, and in communities, you know, it's whoever's, you know, the majority sort of gets to decide the rules. And so, um, any other color, any, any color that's not green, um, is treated differently in these three models. So in the first, on the left, um, there's a word that's called exclusion, and this is a model, right? So that people who are different were excluded completely from the inner circle. And that circle could be community, it could be school, it could be, country, right? You know, um, any, any other, co any color other than green has been pushed to the outside of that circle. They're not allowed in and that's exclusion. In the middle circle, there's um, segregation is the word below it. And um, there's actually two circles represented here. One is the community circle, the, the, the bigger circle with all the greens, all the green dots in it, and then a smaller circle off to the side with all the other colors in it. So that's where segregation, just separating different people who are different. That's a, that's solid us and them, you know, you don't belong in here, you belong over there with others, right, them. Um, and then to the right is a circle with that, with that smaller circle built right into it. So all the greens are there, and there's a smaller circle with the boundary around it with all the different colors within it. So that's integration. And, and that just implies that, um, you know, that you, that people with disabilities, people who are different can be in the community, but they still need to have their own containers. And this model of integration is alive and present in, in our contemporary societies. We see it in group homes, we see it in still institutional care, we see it in day programs, we see it uh, in workshops, um, any place that um, our, our communities, um, our typical community members think that's for them and feel good about it because it's in the community or it's of the community, but it isn't part of the community. The only uh, circle that's truly representative of inclusion is the circle at the top with the word inclusion under it. And that's when all of the colors are in the same circle intermingled. There is no division between us and them. And that's what we're striving for in the citizen-centered leadership notion um, and, and the work that we do together. Um, so I've been influenced by a magnificent teacher and friend, uh, a woman by the name of Beth Mount. She's one of the pioneers of person-centered planning back in the 70s. Um, and citizenship, Beth says, is at the core of person-centered work. And she has put forth three ideals that have become um, an integral part of the of my belief system and the work that I do. And um, those three ideals of citizenship, our shared humanity, is that all people are born with gifts, strengths, capacity, potential, and a purpose in life. And that word purpose is bold, right? We all are born with a purpose. Nobody is left out of that. That all people have a right to equal access, to explore opportunities, to discover and express those gifts. So all people have a right to equal access. So when you think about those circles, equal access can only happen in an inclusion circle, right? And that all people have a responsibility to give of the, their gifts to the benefit of society or to the benefit of others. Three ideals, we're all born with a purpose. We all have the right to equal access to opportunities to explore, discover, and express our purpose. And we have a responsibility to bring it, to bring it for the good of the, the um community. 
Um, so this this slide here is a bee, uh, a picture of a bee on a flower, and that flower is a lupine. Um, and there's a quote by a friend of mine named Mike Green, um, and the quote says, you are a citizen where you are defined by what you contribute, not by what you consume. And the actual, the full quote is, you're defined by what you contribute in the company of others, not by what you consume. And here in the United States, people who rely on disability services are called consumers. And that word got supplanted, got put on people with disabilities by, by non-disabled folks, by people in the, in the human services or in the service industry, thinking that it empowered people. The idea, without asking people who were going to have to carry this label, um, was that consumers are people who can um, purchase, you know, their goods, their services, you know, that that they have power. They have power to, you know, live where they want and, and buy what they want and, you know, hire their staff. Sadly, that's not the case. Um, so in this particular um, rendition of the word consumer um, in this country, anyway, you know, the idea of being a consumer means you use up, you eat, you know, you take, and there's not a lot of give. And so, again, this idea is, uh, that citizen is um, a basic human right where everyone belongs. Everyone has something to offer and everyone has a responsibility to bring it. When people with disabilities are excluded from the expectation of contribution, we, we are violating people's basic civic and human rights. That's my opinion, right? You know, but I'm pretty um, serious about it, you know? So the work that citizen-centered leadership does is, is, is explores how does this happen and what can we do about it? Um, and so this, this um, model here um, comes from a friend of mine who has since passed away. Um, his name is Mike Mayer. And Mike um, would sometimes be a guest lecturer in my class and he would share this model. And when I met the model for the first time, it just helped me to really think about how is it that people who rely on, on services, um, you know, continue to be uh, marginalized, continued to be, you know, excluded, or at least at the, at the very best, you know, integrated in programs in the community. And Mike explained it this way. He said that the bait, this is called beyond accreditation, five-star quality from clienthood to citizenship um, or consumerism to citizenship. And so he says five-star quality is really about the degree to which people have a sense of meaning and purpose and belonging and act and action in everyday community life contribution. And five stars is terrific. You know, so the rubric, the, 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 the litmus paper test is, um, you know, just how involved in the community as contributing active members are people, you know, in mutual, in mutual ways, in, in, in relationships of reciprocity, of give and take, of value. So, um, you know, and Mike says that what we're striving for is five-star quality. So when you're an individual who is reliant on uh, the service in industry to help you, to get you the support and assistance, to, to help you to open up opportunities to explore and discover your purpose, it matters a lot. So the 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 graphic is designed is um, designed in with a line in the middle and and above the line is community right and then below the line is really our systems our our service systems the industry that um, supports people um, you know with disabilities in in this particular case right the line itself is called the transformational threshold. And so what Mike says is like, if you'll note, it's a, it's a divide, um, the, the, the model is divided into three sort of sections. There is, you know, the system itself or above the line, the community itself, and then kind of the byproduct of those elements. So in the community, the byproduct, if you will, is citizen. In the system, it's the client or the consumer. Um, the, the middle section where the stars, that's where the rankings are, is the degree to which people um, 
have access to those equal opportunities in community alongside anyone else. And so below the line, um, there's one star, two star, and three star qualities, remembering that it's about community involvement. And above the line, there's four and five star. So, um, and then to the right, um, that section is, um, who really calls the shots? Who makes the rules? Who's driving the bus, right? You know, and so um, below the line, it's whatever whatever funder or whatever it's system compliance, the things that we're really worried about in terms of, you know, how to, who do we have to answer to? And above the line, it's really about community quality. It's the community decides, you know, we all decide in our churches, we decide in our neighborhoods, we decide in our backyards, we decide in our schools, what are the rules, you know, the norms that we will bring in. And so, you know, Mike is saying, if we think about the programs and services that are that are um, relied upon by people with disabilities, anything below the line is 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 it gets only as high as good, right? Um, in a context of community, right? If people are are not provided access to the community, it's unacceptable. If people are taken on in a van across the, you know, to, to, to go on little rides in the community, little outings, that's mediocrity. So people get out, but it's incredibly controlled. And when people are participating in the community, that's good. But where Mike says that the problem lies is that's your integration. That's where we'll take programs into the community and we'll put people in the community in our programs. But the programs are still governed by the organization. And that organization is still worried about system compliance. And so we'll always pay that piper versus the community that when people are met, have full membership, you know, um, it's four star quality. People know who they are. They rec they're recognized for their gifts and for their contributions. And of course, five star is kind of, uh, you know, like when people, everyone knows your name, everybody, you know, recognizes um, that we're all better together. And my God, I didn't know how much I, I needed this person in my life until I met them, right? And so I use this model a lot to just try to help people to think about you know, where in the world, where do you spend most of your time? How are we supporting people if we're in that role with folks? Um, how are we supporting people? Are we reliant on our own vans? Are we reliant on our own programs? I often use the story, I used to help people get jobs. I was a job coach uh, and an employment specialist. And that, and I realized that folks were not hiring the person; they were hiring me and my organization. And we, and I would sadly, this was many years ago, but you know, I would talk about, don't worry about it. If there's any any problem, we'll take care of it. And I never put the responsibility, you know, of making the connection between the employee and the employer, their issue, not that I wasn't holding the bag for all of that, if that makes any sense. So when programs are in the community, it's better, but it's still driven. Um, Mike used to say, who's driving the bus, whose name is on the side of the van? Um, and that's who's really showing up in community. So I just wanted to drop these thoughts. I hope they made some kind of sense to you um, and, and have um, interested you in some way or have caused you to, you know, um, have questions or conversation because I'd love to now um, end our recorded part of this and turn over um, conversation to you all, you know, to say, and, and I'd love to lead with this question from Beth Mount. Um, you know, if we can start to maybe reflect on this and then explore the question, what are our communities missing when people with disabilities are not there? 